May the glory of Christ's resurrection be full in your heart today. May the joy of Christ fill you. I want to share a few announcements, one of which is we always receive prayer requests at this uh, part of our web, our website address, tumclr.org, and we, we want to join in praying with you, so share that. So this month, it's Bach, month of April, it's cereal month at uh, our food pantry. And let me tell you what y'all did in, in, in the month of March. We were looking for green vegetables because last week, Trinity was able to provide a ham, green vegetables, potatoes, bread, uh, and corn for all the families that were there. But you all, in the month of March, shared 858 items, including 537 green vegetables. Enough for not only last week, yeah, that's a big clap at home. That's enough for us to continue having some vegetables to share with people. So thank you so much for your generous spirit. Also, uh, if you know someone that doesn't have access to the internet, we'll be happy to give them information where they can phone in and listen to the service. And then thanks to you all that share the service on Facebook or YouTube. It helps us to multiply our effort. And so many of you have been so gracious in your giving, many of you learning to give online, and uh, we appreciate that, and that's the way to do that, or, or to share in our services as well. Next week, in-person worship in the sanctuary resumes. Uh, we have a little, uh, some limitation in seating, so we need you to, to call for a reservation. That way we'll make sure that there's safe seating for everyone. We're going to ask you to, to wear a mask and to stay six feet apart from people that you don't live with, or, or however you're supposed to describe that. Our communion offering today and our offering throughout the month will be for Methodist Family Health Get Up and Give. We also are receiving not only cash gifts, but in-kind gifts, toiletries, towels, washcloths, that sort of thing. In our e-blast or in the newsletter, there's information about that. But enough of this. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. The music of Easter always draws us to remind us the beauty of Easter, like these Easter lilies and these beautiful flowers. And thanks, Charles Watson, for uh, drawing our hearts. This gives you a, a wonderful sort of visual sense. And next year on Easter, I'm convinced you will even be able to smell the Easter lilies. And at home, if you, if you try hard enough, well, you might be able to. Welcome to this service. From Mark's Gospel, when the Sabbath day was over, Mary Magdalene and Mary, the mother of James and Salome, bought spices so they might go and anoint Jesus' body. And very early on the first day of the week, when the sun had risen, they went to the tomb. They had been saying to one another, who will roll away the stone from the entrance to the tomb? When they looked up, they saw the stone, which was very large, it had been rolled away. They entered the tomb and saw a young man seated on the right side. They were very alarmed, but he said to them, do not be afraid. You are looking for Jesus of Nazareth who was crucified. 
He has been raised. He is not here. Look, there's the place where they laid him. But go and tell his disciples and Peter that he is going ahead of you to Galilee. You will see him as he told you. And they went and they fled from the tomb, for terror and amazement had seized them. And they said nothing to anyone, for they were afraid. I invite you to sing together our opening hymn, Christ the Lord is Risen Today. my testimony, my witness. Let me tell you, this morning, early, I went to the tomb and I noticed the stone was rolled away. I began to weep. I wasn't sure what had happened. And then I went and I looked inside and there were two men dressed in white, and they were sitting where Jesus had been. 
I began to cry. I didn't understand. But the men told me, he is not here. Christ is risen. Oh my, I was so confused and I was crying. I was so unsure, I turned to come back here. And then I almost ran into the gardener. The gardener. He asked me why I was weeping. And as I explained, he said my name, Mary. And then I knew it wasn't the gardener. It was him. It was my teacher, my Lord Jesus. Jesus told me to come and tell you that he is going to the Father and we are to go to Galilee and he will meet us there. Friends, there is power in this word that Christ is risen. He dwells within us. He changes us. He shapes our hearts and our minds. Praise God. Christ the Lord is risen today. Amen. And let us pray. Holy God, living God, we come today with great joy and expectation because we know that today is the day we celebrate again Christ risen from the dead. Christ overcoming even death itself. We come celebrating and knowing that the cross was not the final chapter. It was the next to the last. It was the place where we saw your love poured out so completely that it overcame sin and death itself. And as bridge for us, whatever divide exists between us and you, finding in the forgiveness of sin, finding in the opening to new life and beginning life and hope again. Oh God, as we come before you this morning, we come aware of so many places of darkness and sadness. Christ knew that darkness and sadness on his journey. And so he walks with us in the midst of that. And there is no pain, there is no challenge greater than his love for us and his presence with us. And now he comes to show the hope and the life, the new beginning and the new possibility. May we be those who not only know that joy of Easter, but those who seek to live their life like Mary, as a testimony, as a witness to what we know, that you have sent Jesus into the world and he has been raised that we might have life life abundant and eternal in you. For this gift, O oh God, we give you thanks, and we give you praise. Amen.
Amen. I love that song. It uh, has such energy, and it reminded me as I was listening to it, we're not just like here in the United States, here in Little Rock, across the world. Christians are proclaiming Christ is risen in so many languages and so many ways, but the Word is one, that Christ is risen indeed. I want to say how much I appreciate uh, so much uh, our musicians, He Kyung, and, and all of the musicians, our singers, uh, also to those that help make that happen, uh, especially Dave Carey, and then our guys in the sound booth, uh, Steve Bonds, Matthew Metcalf, and Mark Hotchkiss. We are grateful today, we are grateful throughout this time that we have, uh, we have such a wonderful dedicated crew. This takes hours uh, for all of their parts, and we are grateful. Thank you so much uh, for that. You know, on Easter Sunday, I usually have picked uh, one of the four lessons from uh, the Gospels as the text for my sermon. But this year, I was led to, uh, to really be uh, looking at what Paul says in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 15. Paul is really reflecting there on, on the resurrection. And it's the next to the last chapter in this first long letter to the Corinthians. The last was sort of housekeeping. You know, he's kind of, you know, just given some housekeeping details. But so it is that the very kind of climax of this letter is when Paul focuses his thoughts on what it means to be a person who believes and lives the resurrection. And so it is that I picked the first 11 verses of chapter 15 of 1 Corinthians. Listen for the Word of God for us. Paul writes, Now I would remind you, brothers and sisters, of the good news that I proclaim to you, which you in turn received and in which you stand. It is that through which you are being saved, and if you hold firmly, I proclaim to you, unless somehow you come to believe it in vain. I handed to you of first importance what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins according to the Scriptures, and that He was buried and raised on the third day according to the Scriptures. And then He appeared to Cephas, Peter, and then to the Twelve, and then to James, and then to five hundred men and women, and then to the apostles. And last of all, as to one who was untimely born, he appeared to me. For I am the least of the apostles. I am unfit to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, what I am and His grace toward me has not been in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but God's grace that is with me. Whether then it was they or I, so we proclaim and so we come to believe in the resurrection of our Lord. This is the Word of God for us. Thanks be to God. And let us pray. Holy God, we come with, uh, with grateful hearts for the Gospels, for all that the Apostles have shared about, about Christ's res resurrection, those who are eyewitnesses, that they have shared that witness with us. May we hear it, may we know it, and may we share it. In the name of Christ, amen. So on Monday this week, Trent Roberts was working, doing some volunteer work in our office, and I walked in and he said, so this is the week that reminds you why you're a Christian. I've thought about that all week long, because that's the truth. Holy Week is the week that reminds us why we are Christians. As we watch the work of Christ entering the, in Jerusalem, going to that Last Supper, going to the garden, wrestling and choosing to do nothing but the will of God, watching His betrayal, His arrest, his, his trial, His crucifixion, but finally seeing the victory that is ours on Easter. This is the reason that we became Christians and are. Paul reflects in this, uh, in this 15th chapter of, of, of uh, Corinthians very clearly on what sort of is the earliest kind of authentic, clear statement of the gospel. And we see it when he says, 
Christ died according to the scriptures. He was buried, and on the third day he rose according to the scriptures. In, in other words, before uh, all of what he did was in accordance with what God had been doing from the beginning as he sought to redeem us and draw us into, unto himself. So that Christ died, was buried, and was raised, and then he appeared to Peter and to the 500 and to James and then to the apostles and, to, and then finally to Paul himself. So that he gives us at the beginning this sort of what he, what he would say, I think is a kind of gospel in a nutshell. It is everything that we need to know to begin that sort of saving relationship with God in Christ. The other details of the New Testament help us, but you must know that Christ came. He died, he was buried and raised for us because that's what God has been doing from the very beginning. And so it is in His redeeming work, we see the love of God in its fullest. And, and we discover not only in the cross, but in the resurrection, that this is the power of God, that is the power of God's love, and nothing, nothing in all creation can take it from us or separate us from God. And that, dear friends, is the good news. For Without the resurrection, Jesus would be a martyr. Jesus would be a really good man who got it in the end. Jesus would be one of the great teachers of the world. Jesus would be the kind of role model all of us should follow. But because of this resurrection, this victory over death and the grave and sin itself, he becomes the Lord of our life. In the same way that the earliest gospel proclamation that we read in the book of Acts is Christ died and was put to death for us, buried and raised for us. So the earliest sort of proclamation of the Christian faith was Kyrios Christos, Christ is Lord. That was what you needed to know and that is what you needed to, to recognize because then you could place your life in this one who had bridged for us the divide that would be there between us and God that our own sin and shortcoming would bring. Creating in his death and the love that he shows on the cross what becomes for us a kind of bridge across that which would, would be a gulf between us. But he also shows us the way to life itself. So Paul is saying to the Corinthians, never forget that the primary thing you have to remember is the resurrection, for that is what separates Christ's life from any other, for it is the one that gives us the victory. Hold fast, he says, to the resurrection, or your faith would be in vain, be of no use, be of no value. Now, I don't know whether it's not clear exactly what's going on in Corinth when he addresses them. You have to be sure you keep believing in the resurrection, like, duh. But is there sort of a fuzziness about their commitment and understanding? Are they kind of going, well, you know, I think it was sort of like a spiritual thing. You know, maybe, really, you know, maybe it was just kind of, you know, I don't know. He said, no, it is, this is the word. Not resuscitation, but resurrection, overcoming death. When there seemed no other way, God has created a completely new way for us. So Paul then does something wonderful in what he does. Because part of what he says is, this is what Christ has done for us. And he appeared to the disciples, to those closest to him. He appeared to James, his brother. He appeared to 500 men and women that had been close followers of his. But then Paul reminds us that he appeared to him. And Paul, in that moment, helps us to see that resurrection and Christ's resurrection is not simply an event for us to remember. As important as it is to remember, Paul is pointing to the fact that it is a present reality for us, that Christ is alive, not just Christ came alive, He is alive and He changes our lives, for that saving grace is for all of us throughout the world. But one of the things that Paul does in his sharing that Christ has appeared to him even though Paul is one that seems untimely born, a violent persecutor that becomes the greatest advocate, Paul says it is specific. The grace of God is God so loved the world, but he also was raised 
for you and for you and for you and for me. It's that specific as well. And that makes those enormous transformations possible. It not only begins our life in Him, but it helps to transform and continue to transform our lives. You know, I'm always fascinated, uh, and, and I love Anne telling the story today, allowing you to, to, to enter into the emotion that was there. I don't know what Mary and the others that were going to the tomb that day expected. I've always had the sense that as they made their way there, they were sort of drudging, kind of their feet, you know, sort of dragging. And that feeling you have when your shoulders are kind of sagging under a weight that you've been carrying. Carrying some spices, there was some weight physically, but a weight greater than that. Wondering about the mundane. How will we roll the stone away? What will have happened? Will there be trouble? Will, you know, all the things that could have filled their minds. I don't know what they expected to find, because they had seen him on the cross to die. Those women that went to the tomb were the women that had the courage to stand by the cross. And they had seen as Joseph and of Arimathea and Nicodemus had taken Jesus to that tomb in which no one had ever lain before. They didn't know much, but they knew the depth of their sadness, and they carried it with them, and they knew that dead people stay dead. That's one of the sure things that they knew until they didn't. Until they realized that for us, we often see in our own lives that while it not, may not be physical death, it may be an obstacle in our lives that we think is as dead as death. And God looks at that and says, there's another way where there's life and there's hope and I will be in the midst of it. It's so interesting when you read the Gospels. So often when angels appear, people are fearful. I believe I would have been too. But as Mary comes and the women come, they're trudging their way along, as I said, and they arrive to see the stone rolled back, and they can't explain that. And they look inside, and there is the one. In Luke's gospel, it, it, I, I love what it says. There are two angels there who say, why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here. He has gone before you. Now go and tell. Now go and tell. Dear friends, we receive the news that is the best news of all news, that Christ is risen. For us, new life, eternal life, and life that with new beginning is possible. Don't hold it. Go and tell it in the words you share and the life you give and share. May others see and know that Christ is alive in this world but that Christ is alive in you. Thanks be to God for alleluia. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Amen. I invite you to take a moment to listen and allow that good news to sit, to sit within you and bring you joy.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks. It is right always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you formed us in your image and you breathed into us the breath of life. When we turned away and our love failed, you delivered us from captivity and made covenant to be our sovereign God. You spoke to us through your prophets and so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, for the baptism, by the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to the church and delivered us from slavery to sin and death and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. Once we were no people, but now we are your people. We are God's people. We declare your wonderful deeds to all the world, for you called us out of darkness into your marvelous light. And so it is that we come on this day to give thanks at this table. And we come to remember how Christ was made known in the breaking of bread that very day of the resurrection as they made their way, those two traveled to Emmaus and then invited in the stranger who was the Lord himself. And in the breaking of the bread and the drinking of the cup, it was as he said it would be at the Last Supper. So we remember those words and instruction. We remember how Jesus gathered with his disciples at the Last Supper there in that upper room, and, and he took some of the bread and he blessed it. And then he broke it. And then he gave it to the disciples. He said, take and eat, for this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me, and I will be present with you. We remember that when the supper was over, Jesus took the cup, and once again he gave thanks. He gave it to the disciples, and he said to them, drink from this, all of you, for this is the cup of the new covenant that's poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. He said, do this as often as you drink it, and do it in remembrance of me. So, in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ offering for us, and we proclaim the mystery of our faith. Christ has died, Christ has risen, and Christ will come again. Pour out, we pray, your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. O oh God, make them be for us the body and blood of Christ, that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by your blood. O oh God, by your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes. In his final victory, and we feast at the heavenly banquet. We pray this through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church. All honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and always. And now we, with the confidence of the children of God, pray together the prayer that our Lord has taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Dear friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God. I invite you at home, if you have some bread, to take that and to share it with the juice you have. If not, allow this to be a moment of God's presence in your life. For Christ our Lord is risen, is among us and with us. Thanks be to God. Amen.
and let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ and in his remembrance, may we share the love that you place in our heart. Amen. Well, so if you didn't get anything else today, here it is. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed, because that's what you need. You know, I don't know if that's a, a message that might be new to someone watching. It may be a, one you've heard throughout your life. It may be drawing you to commitment of spirit. If that would be so, I'd love to visit with you. Commitment of faith for the first time, a commitment of faith to be part of this church. We would love to have you. It's a live place to be and to grow in faith. You know, our closing hymn today is one that I particularly like. And I love it on Easter because I think it reminds us not just that Christ was raised, but Christ is alive. In this beautiful hymn, Brian Wren helps us to see how Easter people, like the risen Christ present in their lives every day. Let's sing together, Christ is alive. May the joy of Easter fill you today. May the love of God be yours 
more deeply than you've ever known. May the peace of Christ abide in you and the strength of of the Spirit sustain you today and always. Alleluia. Alleluia indeed.